Last time we left off in the middle of chapter 6 of Romans, um, not the exact middle of course, but the, the chapter is divided into two parts. The first part is a little longer than the second part, but they, uh, they both begin by asking uh, s similar sounding questions. And these questions are anticipated from what Paul has said at the end of chapter 5. I have suggested that I believe that chapter 5, 21, has uh, given cause for Paul to take an aside, a parenthesis, to discuss questions that could arise from a misunderstanding of things he said in that ending of chapter 5, and that that parenthesis is chapter 6 and 7, so that when you come to chapter 8, verse 1, Paul is essentially resuming. Uh, much of what he had hinted at or, or moved, moving forward from chapter 5. Um, there are other ways to look at the structure of this section, but that's how I, I'm understanding it. That Paul has said some things, some phrases, uh, that someone unfamiliar with the phrases or not quite understanding uh, what their import is could really be misled if Paul doesn't clarify. So in chapter 5 and verse 20, he said, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, suggesting that even though uh, the law caused human sin to become more blatant, more evident, uh, this did not hinder God from forgiving sin nonetheless. And the more blatant the sin, the more magnanimous the grace appeared for his having passed over it through Christ. So that he said, when the sin abounds, grace abounds more. But someone might think, well, then if abundant sinning causes grace to abound and, and to appear magnanimous and to, and to be glorified, then maybe sinning is a good thing because it causes grace to abound. So he asked the question, shall we, which, in verse, chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And, of course, his answer is no, because even if we thought that was a good thing, we, it's not really going, how, how could we live in sin when we've died to sin? And when we're baptized, we're baptized into Christ's death, and we have to understand what that means is that we were in Christ, just as we had been in the old man, Adam, we are in Christ, and his death is our death. He died to sin and lives to God, so we have died to sin and lived to God. And I mentioned that many people who are understanding the structure of Romans differently than I do, they think that by chapter 6, Paul has turned a corner, is talking about sanctification, and is telling us how to defeat sin. One of the great challenges that every Christian, I think, finds is how to live up to the convictions we have. Once we've decided we want to follow Jesus and live a holy life, the next question is, how do I do that? Because I really have, you know... Uh, I fall short. And he's going to address that later on in chapter 7. But Christians, because they are frustrated, as, as chapter 7 describes, they often think that Paul ought to be giving us here an answer to the question, how do we actually live up to these convictions? How do we stop sinning? And so there are many who believe that chapter 6 has turned to this subject. How do we conquer sin in our life? How do we live a holy life? How do we stop allowing ourselves to fall into sin. And so they think that Paul is here talking about dying to sin in some kind of a subjective sense, that, you know, I've, I've all, sin has always been very much alive in my, in my thinking and in my psyche, and, and that's one reason it, it conquers me, because even when I've decided to do right, yeah. these sinful ideas and desires arise from my heart. They seem to overwhelm. I, I'm, I succumb, and therefore I need to know how to die to that, to when the sin comes knocking, that it finds no, no living man answering the door. So that it's a subjective uh, liberation from these motions of sin that many people feel that Paul wants to talk about here. So when he says we've died to sin, and in verse 6 when he says our old man has been crucified so the, uh, the body of sin might be done away, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, 
no longer slaves of sin sounds like, okay, sin will not be cracking the whip anymore and, and, and dictating my behavior. I'm not going to be succumbing to that anymore. So I have suggested that Paul is not here talking about sanctification. He's talking about some of the theological ramifications of justification. The issue is since we are justified, some people think, well, that was easy. You know, I just got justified by repenting. I just got justified by believing. I got justified by Jesus, not by me. It's not anything I did. It's what he did. And therefore, nothing I do is going to be a problem to that. So I might as well just go on and sin. And after all, it might even glorify God because his grace will simply abound through my sinning. And Paul's not talking about how to stop sinning. He's talking about why to stop sinning. He will discuss how we overcome sin, but he hasn't come to that yet. I don't believe he comes to that until chapter 8. But some people think he's already talking that way. Verses like chapter 6, verse 7, where it says, He who has died has been freed from sin. The word freed from sin has caused many people to say, Oh, see, there you go. That, that sinful urge, I'm free from that now. It's gone. And the doctrine of entire sanctification has arisen out of this section of Romans 6, thinking that you should have a... Uh, sanctification, some would say uh, as a second work of grace. Some would say as a something that you, you develop at, by simply grasping these truths, but that uh, you become free from sinning, or at least relatively free from sinning. Some would say absolutely, and some would say just better at not sinning. Well, I do believe that some of that reflects reality in our lives, but that's not what Paul's talking about here. Because as I said, the word freed in Romans 6, 7 is actually in the Greek justified or cleared. So Paul is still talking about justification. What he's saying is our justification has come about through dying with Christ. And while Christ was alive, sin had every opportunity to own him. He did have passions and lusts like other men. He had glands. He had appetites. He was able to be tempted. Sin was always, you know, seeking to lay claim on him, but he didn't succumb to it. And once he died, sin, you know, couldn't lay any legal claim even to tempt him anymore. Now, we are tempted still because we have not been resurrected as he has. We haven't physically died. But the claims of sin upon us are gone, and therefore obedience to sin is inappropriate. And he's going to expand on that in the latter part of chapter 6, by raising a second question. In verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Now you'll see at first, there's a very close similarity to the question in verse 1. The first one was, shall we continue in sin? And the other is, shall we sin? Not much difference in those questions, it would seem. In the first case, though, he said, shall we continue in sin? Because that will make grace abound. And now he says, shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? Now, it's, it seems obvious that these two questions that are close in meaning have a slightly different aspect. The first one is, is it actually recommendable that we sin? Is it, is it maybe glorifying to God? Grace will abound if we do. Isn't that a good thing? So maybe it should be encouraged. Maybe we should encourage each other to sin so grace may continue to abound. And... So that's really kind of what underlies the first question. Is it, you know, can anyone say that we shouldn't sin? Maybe we should all sin so that grace would abound. The second one has more to do with, okay, whether it's recommended or not, you know, we're not under the law. So it seems like we could just go ahead and sin. Even if it's not recommended, there's no repercussions. There's no law to condemn us. We're under grace. And therefore, although both both questions have a similar aspect. They both have misunderstandings of grace. They both mention grace and sin. The first is sinning might seem appropriate because grace looks so good by contrast. The other is sinning might be something we could do because we can get away with it because grace isn't going to condemn us for it. So regardless whether it's a good thing to sin or a bad thing to sin, without a law to condemn us, we can even do bad things and get away with it because we're under grace. Now, where did this line 
in verse 15, because we are not under the law, but under grace come from? Well, in the immediate context, it came from the previous verse. As Paul was winding down what he said in answer to the first question, in verse 14, he says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Well, that's the same line. We're not under law, but under grace. So somebody think, well, if I'm not under law, but under grace, I guess there's nothing to stop me from sinning, right? I might as well sin. When Paul said, though, in verse 14, we're not under law, but under grace, he was no doubt referring back to the end of chapter 5 again. Because as he had said in chapter 5, verse 20, where, the, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, and that led to the phraseology of the question in Romans 6, 1. Grace abounds. Okay, well, that's sin, so grace may abound. Yet in the next verse in Romans 5, 21, he says, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign. Now here we have grace reigning. We're not under the dominion of sin. We're under the dominion of grace. We're not under the dominion even of the law, but under grace. If we're under grace, that means we're not under sin or under the law. And if we're not under the law, but under grace, well then, let's party on. And, and so Paul understands there will be people who, and boy, he was not wrong. There have been a lot of people throughout history who have made that very mistake. Well, I'm under grace. Don't tell me I can't sin. You're a legalist. You're, you know, you're you know, into works. I have, I'm under grace, so it doesn't matter what I do. It may matter. It may be that God's not technically pleased with it, but hey, he can't do anything to me because he's banished the law. And if there's no law, I can get away with hurting God's feelings if I want. And uh, this is an entirely different thing than the first question. The first question was more or less, would God maybe appreciate it if I sin? Because that'll make his grace abound. Here it's, even if God doesn't appreciate it, can he really condemn me for it since I'm not under the law? So it's more a matter of, I can get away with it, right? And Paul again says, certainly not. Now, what are they misunderstanding here? Here's how he answers. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin to death or obedience to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more, un more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are, not, you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, in my opinion, uh, Romans 7 continues to address the same question that was raised in chapter 6, verse 15, but we'll stop for the moment uh, to discuss this part of his answer to it, and then there's another part to his answer. Um, so, if someone's saying, okay, Paul, you say we're, that grace is reigning. We are under grace. So, if we're under grace, we're not under law. So, you know, how in the world can you reasonably say that I shouldn't live in sin if I want to? And I believe what he's saying is, if you want to live in sin, no doubt you can, but you're not being reigned over by grace then. You can't be reigned over by grace and live in sin because the one you obey is your true master. That's his statement in verse 16. Don't you know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves that you're obeying. So you might say, I'm a slave of grace. I can do what I want. Well, if you're a slave of grace, you'll be obeying grace. 
the one that you're yielding to day by day, if it's sin that you're yielding to, then you're a slave of sin. Don't talk about being under grace. You're not under grace. You're obviously showing yourself to be under sin. The master that you have will be, in fact, determining what you're doing. That's the nature of having a master and being a slave. If you are a slave to grace, then grace will be calling the plays and you will be obeying it. If you are not obeying grace, that master, then you're simply displaying that that isn't your master and you've got another. In others, you might think you're a Christian. You might hold to a doctrine that you're under grace. But if you're not showing it in your life, you're not really, that's not really your master. You've got another master that you're obeying. And that's sin. So he says, uh, you are slaves to that one that you present yourselves to obey. That is, as you are daily presenting yourself in the service of sin. Well, you're, you're reporting for duty from your master, sin. If you're reporting for duty to your master, grace, well, you're presenting yourselves to a different kind of behavior. So you can know whether you're under grace or not. Who are you obeying? That's who you're under. The one you present yourselves as, and your members and so forth, as instruments to obey, uh, well then, as slaves to obey, that's your master. He says, whether of sin, which will lead to death, that is, if you're, if you're obeying sin, well, you're a slave of sin. That's your master, and he's going to give you death. The wages that sin pays is death. As he says in verse, later on in verse 23, the wages of sin is death. You, that's your master. They're going to pay wages, which is death. Or if you're presenting yourself to, uh, uh, to obedience to God, uh, obedience to righteousness, he later says that leads to life. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I've been talking about obeying grace, but that might be a very strange concept to some of us. What do you mean to obey grace? What is grace telling me to do? What rules has grace put upon me? Well, Paul doesn't discuss it here in detail. He doesn't do it like he does some other places. One of those places in Titus chapter 2, he tells us exactly what grace tells us to do. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, Paul says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. So you want to know what grace teaches, what, God, what grace tells us to do? Here's what grace tells us to do. The grace of God has appeared, and that grace teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Now, that's not a lot of rules, but it certainly is a direction it points us. It doesn't have a list of commands because it's not really a law, but it is a dynamic that inclines us against worldly lusts and inclines us toward godly living, living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age and denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Grace teaches you that. It's interesting he doesn't say grace commands that as if it's a, a law type uh, slave master. It's gracious. And, and Paul is going to tell us more in, the, in this part of Romans 6 that we're in and 7 exactly what it is, what the method is, how, how grace makes us live better lives. But he's saying this is what grace does teach you. If a person is living an ungodly life, and they say, don't judge me, I'm not under the law, I'm under grace, then Paul would say, excuse me, I don't think you are. If you are under grace, it would be teaching you something. And you're not being taught, apparently. You would have this inward instructor telling you, give up your ungodliness and your worldly lusts. Start living soberly and righteously and godly in this present life. That's what grace teaches us. So if you're ruled over by grace, that's going to be what you're taught not by an external code of law, but by the spirit of grace in you, transforming the way that you're oriented. You see, Paul is very emphatic that Christianity is not law. Every religion is. Every religion says, okay, we should be doing better than we are, and here's the rules we should be keeping. And, and it imposes laws of some kinds upon people. But God, who of course insists that we live holy lives, he doesn't, in, he doesn't impose a, a list of rules. 
He just says, how about if I just go inside there and, re and, and re retweak you, you know, reorient you? How about if I go in there and change who you are inside? What if my grace is sufficient to alter what you want to do? That's how grace teaches us, by making us different inside, as he will point out very clearly here. But what he's saying here in, in Romans 6, then, is that when you talk about being under grace but going on in sin, you're talking about like riding two different horses, two different directions. <clears throat> you're either living in sin and therefore you're not, you're not under grace because you're obeying a different master than grace. Or you're under grace and you're, you're doing what grace teaches you to do. Whoever it is you're obeying is your true master. That's, a, that's easy to see in any, uh, you know, city in the Roman Empire, there were lots of slaves. And they dressed differently and, and so forth than other people. And you wouldn't have too much trouble finding out whose slave someone was if you wanted to know. You could simply watch and see who he's taking orders from, whose business he's doing. Okay, well, this guy is obviously a slave. I wonder who owns him. Oh, he's buying stuff for this guy. He's, he's uh, doing chores for this guy. I, I, I heard him report to this guy and I saw him get some some instructions. You know, the person he's obeying, that's his master. That's, a, that's obvious. And so Paul's saying it's absurd to talk about being under grace and living in sin, since if you're under grace, you're going to live in grace and, and the instructions grace gives. And you can tell who someone's uh, master is. Verse 17, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and some manuscripts say which was de delivered to you. It doesn't make too much difference, but this reference, the form of doctrine, has intrigued me for some time because remember the word doctrine, we use the, doc the word doctrine very commonly to refer to theology, don't we? I mean, the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of the deity of Christ, the doctrine of justification by faith, these, the doctrine of, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit or whatever. These are like theological truths. When we think of doctrine, I mean, a lot of people say, I don't want to hear any doctrine. I just want to be taught how to practically live for God because they think of doctrine as something else than that. Doctrine, they think, is just the theological concepts that you can either have or not have, and, and it doesn't matter that much. But the word doctrine doesn't mean that. That's just what it's come to be in our modern usage. And when we find the word doctrine in Scripture, we need to we need to make a mental note. This is just a word that means teaching. It does not specify, simply the word doctrine does not specify theological teaching per se. It could be practical teaching. And that is, in fact, what Paul means when he uses the word doctrine in virtually every instance that he does so. If you'd look, for example, to what he says in the pastoral epistles, in, in 1 Timothy 1.9, he says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for a lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly, for the sinners, for the unholy, for the profane, for murderers, fa murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, fornicators, and so forth. And he gives all these things, and he says at the end of verse 10, And if there's any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine, or sound teaching. Well, he didn't talk about Arianism or Nestorianism or... Uh, Gnosticism here. He talked about behavior, bad behavior, sinning, is contrary to good doctrine, good teaching. The assumption is what the church has been taught is not to behave that way. Doctrine or teaching is very primarily about behavior. I'm not saying theology doesn't have a role, and I believe that we do find theological teaching in the epistles. But when Jesus told his disciples to make more disciples in Matthew 28, 19, he said, go and make disciples and teach them. But teach them what? Theology? Well, maybe somewhere along the line, yes, but that's not what he said. Teach them to observe all things I have commanded you. In other words, the teaching, the doctrine of the church was teaching to obey what Jesus said, which is a very different kind of curriculum than mastering the niceties of, of arcane theology. And I like mastering the niceties of arcane theology. I'm not against doing it, but that is not the priority. When, when God, Paul talks about doctrine, 
he's essentially talking about teaching about how to live. If you look over at Titus chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine or teaching. Now, what, he's going to give us some examples of what sound teaching or doctrine looks like. Okay, that the older men should be sober, reverent, self-controlled. That's what temperate means. Sound in faith, in love, and in patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that, they, that the older women would admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded. Now, he's got four demographics here. Uh, old men, old women, young women, young men. And each of them are to be taught certain things. And these are the things that are sound doctrine. But none of them are theological per se. They are about how to behave. Be sober, be reverent. Don't be dr drinking too much. You young women, learn how to keep the house. Love your children, love your husbands. Don't be gossips. You know, this is practical teaching here. And this is what Paul calls doctrine. So as we read the Bible, and especially if we have Bibles that use that older word doctrine, some might use the word teaching, which becomes maybe less confusing. But we still might think, because of the way the church has been oriented in the past centuries, that sound teaching has more to do with making sure your theology isn't skewed than it has to do with your life behavior not being skewed. The, what people were taught was to observe everything Jesus commanded. It's a behavior that was, dis what made Christians distinctive was their behavior. That's how they differed from the Romans and the Jews. And so when Paul then in, in Romans chapter 6 talks about the, that form of doctrine or teaching to which you were delivered, in all likelihood he's talking about how you were taught how to live. As Christians, you were taught how to live. And he says, you were slaves of sin. In other words, you were not living as you should. But now you've been taught properly how to live. And he says, you obeyed from the heart. This is Romans 6, 17. You obeyed from the heart that form of teaching to which you were delivered. Now, to which you were delivered, what's, what's that suggest? The word form here, uh, you wouldn't know it unless you check the Greek text, but it's the word type or tupas. Now, we've encountered the word tupas in other connections before, like, you know, the Passover is a type of Christ or something, or Adam. Adam's a type of Christ in Romans 5. The word tupas was used there too. Tupas, the Greek word tupas means a pattern or a mold. And although we use it to speak of how something in the Old Testament was a pattern of Christ, or corresponded to Christ in some characteristics, in the Greek language, the word was a very common household word. Like, uh, they didn't have jello back then, but if a gel, what we would call a jello mold would be a very typical example of a, a tupas, a type. It was a, a form that gave shape to something that was not solid until it became solid. You, you pour uh, you know, liquid jello into a mold, it takes the shape of the mold, it hardens, then you remove the mold. Or if you're building a patio, you set up a, a frame of two by fours. You measure the size and shape you want it to be. You pour in the wet concrete, the, the frame remains until the, the concrete hardens. Then the frame becomes obsolete because it was only there to shape the, the permanent structure not to remain there. Now, teaching about how to live is a form that we are poured into, we're delivered to it. And I, this is what I think Paul is suggesting, that the teachings we've had about Christian living, they define the shape that our life is supposed to look like, how we're supposed to behave, the, the, the pattern of our behavior. It's a pattern or a mold of teaching. Do this, don't do that. You old men, be sober, be reverent. Don't drink too much and all that stuff. Those, that's the, the pattern. The Christian teacher teaches the people, this is what Christian life looks like. This is its size and shape and characteristics. Now, you are being delivered 
into the mold of that teaching. Your life is going to conform to that shape. The mold will eventually you know, not play the same role once your life has taken that shape somewhat permanently. The teaching is there to tell you what shape you're supposed to be, but there's something in the nature of the wet concrete that makes it harden into that shape or become that shape itself. And therefore, the mold is only there to define it, but there's got to be something in the substance that's poured into the mold, in the jello, in the concrete, that's going to determine that it's not going to stay liquid. It's going to become solidly and permanently that shape. Now, it's interesting that Paul would use that imagery. We talked about, you were slaves of sin, but you have now obeyed from the heart that mold of teaching. That structure, that pattern that you've heard taught, that Christians should, you know, not, you know, they, they should not be selfish. They should be unselfish. They should, uh, you know, put others before themselves and things like that. The things that Christians are taught to do. I've been, as a, as a personality, I've been poured into that mold that I've been taught. Now, initially, sometimes we just have to keep it because we're taught to do it. The mold holds you in place while you're still liquid, you know, while you're not yet hardened into that shape. But there's something in the nature of the new life in the spirit that is supposed to take that shape from an inward impulse rather than just an outward demand of a, of a teaching. And this is a mysterious thing, but Paul talks about it. this is what grace does. Grace works in us. Grace teaches us inwardly. Uh, yeah, we have to have the instructions verbalized at first, but the grace of God transforms our character into that as we obey from the heart. You see, if I disobey the teaching, well, then I'm going to be spilling over the mold and, and I'm going to harden into the wrong shape. When Paul talks about putting on the, old, the new man and putting off the old man, the old man and the new man are shapes, molds. Adam was a certain pattern. Christ is another pattern. As I put on Christ, I'm, I'm in him. I'm taking on his shape as the grace of God and the Spirit of God work in me to change my character and mold me into that shape. But only as I'm willingly, from the heart, obeying. Now, what this means is, suppose I feel that I'm lazy and the Bible thinks it's wrong to be lazy. The Bible says it's wrong. The teachers say, you shouldn't be lazy. You should be diligent in serving God and productive and so forth for him. Okay, so I hear that teaching, and that may be, maybe that's not the way I am right now. Maybe I like to oversleep. Maybe I like to sit around and let others do all the work. Maybe I, you know, I'm just lazy. Well, I hear the teaching. If I obey it from the heart, what does that mean? It means I'm going to start doing things contrary to that laziness. I'm going to start behaving like a diligent person. Even if I'm not feeling diligent, I might still be feeling lazy, but I'm going to say, I'm going to set my alarm a little earlier. I'm going to stop using that snooze button and, 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 and taking the lazy way. I'm going, to, I'm going to just get up and get out of bed when that alarm goes off. I'm not going to feel like it because I'm still lazy, but I'm going to do what a person would do who wasn't lazy. And I'm going to trust God that as I obey from the heart that pattern of behavior, that God's going to shape in me. Remember what Paul said? Work out your own salvation for God works in you. You can, only, you can only make yourself behave a certain way. You can't change your inward part. Only God can do that. But you can do the outward part, and you're required to. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. So, uh, you know, it's like I, I'm lazy, but I see, you know, there's dishes to be done. And I, I know if I sit around long enough, someone else will jump up and do it. On the other hand, I'm going to do what I don't feel like. I'm going to go ahead, and, and I know that uh, serving is more obedient to God than being lazy about it. So I obey that urge. I, I obey what I've been taught to do. I get up and I do the work. And, uh, you know, I, I, put, I do what's against my inclinations because I know from the godly teaching I've had that I'm supposed to reshape my life this way. Now, if, if I only do it legalistically for the rest of my life, I'm just a legalist. But if I'm doing it not to be legalistic, but to honor God, he wants me to be this way, and I'm trusting that he will work in my heart to will and to do of the thing that I'm only able to do. I can do it, but it's hard for me to will it. 
God can work the inside. I can only work the outside. So I'm going to do the outside. I'm going to do the right thing and just trust God to change who I am. And that trusting God activates grace in my life, becomes, you know, it teaches me inwardly. I begin to have these changes inwardly. It's a supernatural thing, of course. And what Paul's saying is, if you really are under grace rather than under law, then when you have obeyed happily from the heart that outward form of teaching that you've received, of course, it's going to ultimately have the effect of changing who you are. So you are no longer a slave of sin in the sense that you don't obey sin anymore. He says you were slaves of sin, but God be thanked, you're not anymore because you've obeyed from the heart that mold that, was that you were delivered into. By being taught proper doctrine, you've been delivered into a, a, a mold. And now you're going to take that shape if you, if you don't resist that mold, if you happily obey it. Now, you know, some people might say, well, then that's just putting on. That's, that, that's just, uh, that's just uh, faking it, you know. What if I really, I mean, if I act better than I am, aren't I a hypocrite? You are, if you're trying to fake people out, you certainly are, because a hypocrite is an actor who doesn't really ever intend to be the, the character he's playing. He's just doing it for an audience. When the audience is gone, he's back to what he was before. The, uh, an, a hip, the word hypocrite in the Greek means an actor. And an actor is being somebody he isn't for an audience, trying to impress somebody else and be very, as convincing as possible that he is something that he really isn't. But he doesn't really intend to ever be that character in real life. He's just pleasing an audience. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were just pleasing an audience. They didn't really intend to be all that they wanted people to think they were. Now, that's an entirely different motivation than saying, I want to please God. I don't care if anyone's looking or not. I want to be a better person. I want to be a person that glorifies God in my life. So I'm going to obey him. And yeah, I might have to go against my grain in the initial stages, especially where my habits are bad habits. I'd have to form some new habits. But... I'm not doing this as a hypocrite. I'm doing this so that I, I will honor God and he'll honor me by shaping me inwardly as I take deliberately those steps to shape my behavior outwardly as he wants me to. And, you know, to say, well, you shouldn't behave that way until you really feel that way is, think how ridiculous that is. You might as well say, well, then if I have lust and I feel like committing adultery, then it's wrong to resist that. You know, you're just being a fake if you resist it because you've got that going on inside. You might as well just do it. Well, that's ridiculous teaching, right? And, and the point is, we know that there are certain sins that we, if we just expressed ourselves without restraint, we'd end up doing sins that we can't, we can't give ourselves permission to do. And so it's very clear that we have to restrain our urges at times. We have, we have sin in our nature that has to be reshaped. Our nature has to be conformed. By the renewing of our mind, we have to be transformed. And this renewing of the mind comes, God works in us to renew our minds as we renew our behavior. And we don't do it perfectly, but that's our determination. Our hearts are in it. We're obeying from the heart. We're not obeying grudgingly because we're under some kind of religious compulsion. Because we're legalistic and we don't really want to do the right thing, but we dare not avoid it. That's legalism. It's that we want to be like Jesus. We want to do, we love holiness. We love righteousness. As Paul later says in Romans 7, in my heart, I, I approve of the law of God. I like it. I just find it hard to obey. So Paul is saying here, if you are in fact following my teaching, you will not serve sin. You will not live in sin. Being under grace is going to cause grace to make some changes some renovations in your life, in your inner life, because grace works inwardly. It's an inward dynamic. And therefore, uh, I'm glad, he says, that you have, in fact, given up on your life of sin because you have chosen instead to obey what you've been taught. But it's not just outward obedience and legalistic conformity. It's more happily, from the heart, submitting, happily being poured into that framework that God has uh, uh, modeled with his with the teaching that we've received and so that's that's really an interesting verse i've always thought and then verse 18 he says and having been set free from sin you became slaves of righteousness now 
when it says we've been set free from sin, we need to uh, not understand that again in the subjective sense. If he was talking about sanctification instead of justification here, then we'd assume that he's saying, now you are Christians, you're free from sin. It doesn't, it doesn't really, you know, give you any problems. It's gone pretty much. You're, you're set free. You're laboring like a slave walks away from, his, from, the, from the master and he doesn't have to ever worry about his master ever trying to exert authority over him again. Well, it's not really that easy. As he's going to point out in chapter 7, there is a law in our members that, that continues to try to bring us into bondage to sin. But it's not a matter here of how you overcome that. It's, again, the same fact as before. It's appropriate to overcome that. It's not appropriate to serve someone who isn't your master. You've been set free. That means you've been liberated and you're not a slave by definition of sin anymore. You are a slave by definition of righteousness. You belong to God now. He's going to say a little later in verse uh, 22, you're, you've become slaves of God. And, and that doesn't mean we're now servile, uh, you, know, you know, slaves in bondage. What it means is he owns us. Slavery was not just a description of the way a person lives. Slavery was a description of who owned them. A slave was, was property owned by somebody. So what he's saying is you've been set free from sin means sin doesn't own you anymore. So there's no reason to give it any, uh, uh, you know, credence as, a, as giving you instructions to what to do. No need to follow that anymore. Now, it will still try to get you to, and if you're weak, you may actually do so. But you are technically free in the sense that slavery doesn't, I mean, sin doesn't own you in, at all. And what does own you is God. So this rather defines the way you should behave. It doesn't predict the way you necessarily will always behave. But frankly, if you are a slave of God, there's something going on inside of you. If you're really born of God, you're, the grace of God is working in you. And as you obey from the heart what he said to do, which is what slaves of God do, you'll find that you change inwardly. So that being a Christian is much more your nature to do rather than something you have to have to do against gravity, you know, against, against uh, all the urges within you. You do find this to be true if you're a Christian long enough, and if you're, during the time you're a Christian, if you're determined to be obedient to God and trusting God to change you, you'll find that over time He does. Now, sometimes not anywhere near as fast as you think He will, and, and a lot of times you may even wonder if it's, anything's happening at all. There are sins, uh, failures, and... Uh, weaknesses, you know, that I knew in my life uh, when I was younger that aren't there anymore. But they are, they were for a long time. So long, in fact, that I sometimes thought, I'm not changing. You know, I, I should be. But, uh, you know, this, some of these things that bothered me 15 years ago, they're still there. I'm not really seeing that big a difference. But 20 years later, 30 years later, I do see the difference. It, the change is often more gradual than we expect it to be. Some of that can be our fault. Some of that can be uh, not our fault so much. Some of it can be the fact that we're not in an environment that in encourages fast growth. And some, some people are. Some people live in environments that are, like imagine if you lived in a situation like you're here uh, all the time. I mean, everyone's going to be encouraging you to be holy. You're going to be studying the Bible. You're, you're going to be, you know, when you're in fellow, immersed in fellowship, you would expect some rather rapid growth if that went on for a long time. Other people are in situations where they hardly have anything to encourage. They don't have a Bible. They don't have uh, any Christian friends. Uh, they don't, can't find any. Uh, I mean, obviously, growth is not the same rate for everyone because some environments are more conducive than others. And some, some people's own temperaments are more amenable to it than others. That's, I mean, and, and sometimes you're, you're just born with a certain temperament, so you're struggling with things other people don't struggle with. But the point is that if it's not happening fast, don't assume it's not happening. God is at work in you to will and do of his good pleasure. And you'd be surprised as you continue, those things that you felt like you had to do only because you were required to, eventually you get a place where you can't imagine wanting to do something else than that. You want to be holy. You want to, you know, you see people who are doing what you used to you think, boy, it sucks to be them. I'm glad I don't do that anymore. And it's not just really a, not, not a self-righteousness, it's more like a relief. Wow, that, that was me. I can remember, can I even remember being like that? I 
have so many friends that used drugs in the 70s and became Christians, and a lot of them, of course, have remained strong Christians to this day. I've, I remember some of them saying at times, you know, I was, uh, I was overhearing some people talking at Starbucks the other day, and, they were, and it was obvious that they used drugs, and it, it just dawned on me, people still do that? <laughs> You mean there's still people out there that use drugs? Yeah, I mean, the, the person himself used to use them all the time, but became a Christian, and, and he can't even relate to it anymore. It's almost like it was a different life, a different person doing that, because in a way it was. They've been transformed. Gradually, it may be, because sometimes those people in the early years of their Christian walk were still struggling to, to stay away from drugs, even falling sometimes. But as they stayed on the path, uh, they found that God changed them inside, so that's just not something that they're about anymore. That's not even appealing. So, you were slaves of sin, but as you've obeyed from the heart this mold, this form of teaching to which you're delivered, you, you get changed, and, and you're set free from sin in the sense that it's not your master anymore, and you don't, it doesn't own you. You became slaves of righteousness. Righteousness, or God, owns you. I speak in human terms. He's saying these, these analogies are not perfect. I'm using human analogies the best, best I can to clarify this because of the weakness of your flesh, in other words, because you're dulled. In. It'd be harder to get this across to you in your state of mind if I didn't use these kinds of analogies and metaphors. For just as you presented your members as slaves or, uh, of uncleanness and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Now notice he says, back when you were a sinner, you presented your members, your body parts, to your master's sin, which was not only lawless, but it led to more unlawliness. You, you become habituated in your choices. Choices become habits, and habits become character. And as you were making the choice to obey sin day by day, it became a habit, and it became character. It became who you are, and you got more and more lawless, more and more, uh, you know, uh, incapable of living in a way that pleases God. But he says, now you need to present your members as slaves to righteousness for holiness. That is resulting in holiness, in sanctification. So he's saying you'll live a holier life. He's not actually, again, if we talk, talk about sanctification as simply a description of how we should be, you know, this is all through Paul's writing. If we're talking about sanctification as a process and how, how we uh, make it happen, that's going to come up later more than in this section here. There are, of course, allusions throughout this section to the need to be holy, to the need not to sin, the inappropriateness of sin. By the way, when he talks about presenting your members as slaves of righteousness, he used a very similar expression just in the earlier part of chapter 6, verse 13. He said, do not present your members as instruments of righteousness to sin. The word instruments there means arms or weapons. Um, so you're in a battle and your, your uh, parts of your body are actually weapons that you employ in the defeat of the, of the powers of darkness. Uh, and you, you use them as weapons for God. So in Romans 6.13, the word instruments there actually is weapons in the Greek. And he says, you present your members. He said also that in this present verse, verse 19, that you present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Presenting is a verb that is translated a little uh, different in some translations of chapter 12, verse 1 of Romans, where he says, yield that you, or that you present, no, it, actually in King James, it's yield in these passages. Uh, it's presented in uh, King James in chapter 12, verse 1, uh, that you present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. This is present the members of your bodies, the same thing. You present your body to God by presenting your members of your, you, you press them into his service of righteousness. So he's basically saying, do the right thing. If you're wondering, shall we sin so that gra because we're not under law but under grace? No. No, you shouldn't. Sin is not your master, so it's not appropriate to sin. If you do live in sin, you're simply showing that sin still is your master, and being under grace is still in your future, if at all. And so uh, you want to live under grace's rule, which will teach you, of course, to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, as he said in Titus. 
Now, verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean you weren't obligated to do right things? Or does it mean this? When you were slaves of sin, righteousness didn't really lay much claim on your conscience. You were kind of free from, from pestering, nagging conscience issues. Righteousness wasn't making its appeal to you. Because you weren't its slave, you were sin slave. And so when you were a slave of sin, righteousness didn't bug you that much. If it started to bug you when you were a sinner, it's probable that you were being drawn to God by conviction. But uh, as a way of life, sinners seem to be free from the conviction that Christians are under. I mean, Christians have no, uh, Christians, when we, we see people doing, well, just living sinfully, we think, I don't understand how they can, how, how, how their thoughts and their conscience can let them do such things as that. I, I couldn't do that. I mean, I could do it in the sense that I, I could be bad enough to do the deed, but I couldn't get away with it with reference to my conscience. My conscience would say, you can't do that stuff, you know. I'm not free from righteousness because I'm a slave of righteousness. So even if I sin... Righteousness is still making its claim on my conscience, saying you can't do that kind of thing. And so what Paul's clearly talking about is the inward change that has come when you're not under law but under grace. You've got a conscience. You've got righteousness that's your master telling you, don't do that, do this. Now, it's, he's not predicting that you will do the right thing. Again, this is not talking about practical uh, steps guaranteeing that you will live a holy life. It's making an argument for living a holy life. There will be other steps to suggest of how to accomplish that. But what he's still addressing is not how do I do it, but should I even do it? And he's saying, yes, you should, because, you know, when you were a, a slave of sin, righteousness didn't bug you. But now you're uh, you know, you're a slave of righteousness. You need to not let uh, sin press its demands on you. It still would like to rule you, no doubt. But you just need to realize that it doesn't have any claim on you. Just like righteousness didn't seem to have any claim on you when you're a slave of sin. Verse 21, for what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? Now here it is too. You want to find a way to live in sin and get away with it because you're under grace, not under law. Why do you want to do a stupid thing like that? What fruit was there in your life when you were doing that before? I mean, think about it. When you lived in sin, if you did have such a time in your life, what was the fruit of that? Usually guilt, depression, uh, damaged relationships. I mean, was this like a good life? Is this something you miss? You want to keep doing that? You want to find an excuse to keep doing that now that you're saved? Why? What fruit was in it? it not, not good fruit, certainly. Can't imagine why you'd want to do that again. He says, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? A Christian is ashamed of their sins. If a person is not ashamed of their sins, it's probably not really truly repentant. That doesn't mean you live in shame and embarrassment all your life and, and, uh, and grief. It just means that remembering them is embarrassing. Remembering them is shameful. I don't remember my sins as something I boast about and say, boy, was that a, boy, was that a good time, you know? No, I, I remember thinking, oh, man, how come that, how come I did that? I wish I'd never done that. I forgot not to do that, you know? I'm ashamed of, the, of that. And that's how the Christian is. If a person isn't ashamed of their past sins, it's hard to know whether they really are Christians because isn't repentance that very change of attitude toward your past sins and toward sin in general. And so there's what argument can, can be made for living in sin, really? It was shameful. You didn't have good fruit in it. The end of those things is death, he says in verse 21. Verse 22, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, which again simply means now we are obligated to serve a new owner, God, rather than sin, you have your fruit to holiness. Now, fruit is different than works in a sense, although works is not a bad thing in itself. In some contexts, works is good, but law works. 
legal works are works that are imposed simply because the law says you have to do it even though you really want to drive faster than that. There's a police, there might be a policeman so, uh, or there's a camera at that intersection or something. So even though you really, 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 really want to drive a lot faster, you stay within the law because there's a law. It's externally imposed. That's not inside of me. I don't want to drive that speed. I want to go faster, but the law imposed outwardly makes me do it, which means I live with some degree of frustration, some degree of resentment toward the rules I'm keeping because I wish they weren't there because inside I really want to be something else. But fruit's different. Fruit arises from what's inside a plant, a tree. Uh, if you've received a different nature, you're going to produce different fruit. And Jesus often made reference to that. He said, you know, you can't get good fruit off a bad tree and you can't get bad fruit off a good tree. The fruit doesn't make it a fruit tree. It, it shows it to be a fruit tree. You can't tape oranges on a oak tree and make it into an orange tree. A, a tree is not made to be of a certain type by having a certain type of fruit put on it. But having a certain type of fruit shows you very well what it is inside. What he's talking about is good behavior for the Christian is generated from a new nature, a good nature, from a, a transformed nature, transformed by obeying from the heart that, that form of teaching. There's an inward transformation, a reshaping, so that the fruit that comes out is to holiness. Unlike the fruit that came from sin, which was just leading to death, we have fruit to holiness now because we now are yielded to God. And in the end, not death, but everlasting life, for the wages of sin is death. As if you keep serving as a slave of sin, you'll get your paycheck at the end of the day, or more properly, at the end of your life, and that's going to be death. It's not going to be a good one. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And there's a, an intentional, obvious uh, gift uh, is different than wages. There's a contrast Paul's making. You serve God, you get a gift. Why? because you don't earn anything with him. If you're a slave, you don't really deserve a wage. You are owned. You just serve because you're loyal to your master. But your master's generous, and he gifts you. He rewards you for good service. He gives you eternal life. Uh, wages are paid to a, a, a servant of sin, but they're not wages that you'd want to be paid in. It's not a currency anyone wants to be rewarded, in, and that's death. So again, he's arguing f uh, against the, uh, the suggestion that sin can be lived in by those who are under grace and not under law. That's what was asked, and the answer is no, and why would you want to? First of all, the fact that you really want to raises questions about whose servant you really are. If you're a Christian, if you've been born again, you want to serve God. There will be frustrations because you don't serve him as well as you want. And in Romans 7, Paul's going to you know, outline some of that frustration. But in Romans 8, he's going to help us know how to uh, defeat sin. The fact that we want to is what he's been talking about, and should and must. But how to do it is going to be talked about in chapter 8. Chapter 7, though, is still going to be addressing what we've been talking about. Actually, I believe chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, is... Um, still on the same question that arose in chapter 6, verse 15. Then there's another question, a third question raised in chapter 7, verse 7. And, he, and that, he's going to answer that in the remainder of the chapter. Then we'll be back on to his main line again. We'll be done with side questions. Mm -hmm.